Hello everyone and welcome to another Camera Jabber video. Today I'm speaking with Photo Joseph who is an expert in Nick Collection and today he's very kindly agreed to take us through Nick Collection 3 by DxO. Hi Photo Joseph, how are you? Hello Angela, I'm very well thank you and yourself? Yeah I'm really good thank you, yeah we've just been through um, quite a significant rainstorm and thunder and lightning and all sorts going on here so I'm kind of glad that's passed and I was indoors. How about yourself, whereabouts are you? Yeah, doing really well. We're actually in Southern Oregon, the West Coast of the United States. It's a, a beautiful part of the country over here, the Pacific Northwest, as we call it. It's very nice. Beautiful. Now, before we get rolling, perhaps you'd like to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Photo Joseph, as you said. I'm a photographer, filmmaker, kind of independent uh, content creator, as the kids say these days. I'm Put, put most of my stuff onto YouTube these days. That's the, that's the big push. I'm uh, mm -hmm. doing a lot of work for commercial clients as well and uh, trying, to, trying to make a living in this crazy COVID world. <laughs> and you've been using Nick Collection for quite some time now. Yeah, I, I would say quite literally since it was born back, what, yeah, 15, 20 years ago in the original Nick Collection from the Nick company that was Nick Software back in the day. Yeah, I've been using it for a long time. Great. I, I can't claim to have been using it quite that long, but I've been using it certainly from when it was Nick Collection and then it went to Google and then it got rescued by DxO, thankfully. Uh, I thankfully, think it's a yeah. Google great was just sitting piece on of it. software. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It definitely is. So perhaps you'd uh, like to share your screen and take us through the key new features. I can do that. I can do that. I suppose that's why I'm here, isn't it? Why don't we do that? Let me get my <laughs> screen up here. <laughs> So of course, what we're showing off today is the, the new Nick Collection. This is now Nick Collection 3, and there's a, a few key highlights. I'm not gonna give you a complete top to bottom demo of everything that the software does. This is really primarily focusing on what's new, and we're gonna start in Photoshop. There's things that are new for Photoshop users and for Lightroom users, and so we're gonna start in Photoshop, and then we'll move our way over to Lightroom. So the first thing we wanna look at in Photoshop is the new selected tool, and that's this palette here, which is gonna look completely new to you because it is a brand new design that actually now looks beautiful. It fits in with the Photoshop interface, the Photoshop UI. And um, I, I like to say that it's not the first thing you're going to close now when you launch Photoshop. It's actually a, a useful and pretty attractive palette. So at its base default, you can see it here, it's quite small and tidy, nice colored icons to launch into each filter. So at this stage, it's really just a shortcut to get into the filters, which obviously you can do from the filter menu as well, but it's just a way to get to them more quickly and it kind of tucks away into the interface nicely wherever you want to put it and just blends in. But the real power of it is when you expand it. And by expanding this out, you get a few things. First of all, you'll see the name of each filter, which is quite handy because there's a lot of them and it can be a little confusing which is which. But also there's a description under each filter. And I really like this. It's, it's one of those things where if you don't use it all the time, like you're going, wait, what is uh, Viveza for? I don't remember, I haven't used that in forever. You get a nice description under here of what it is. So just a, a subtle reminder. But the real power in here is hidden under these tiny little disclosure triangles. And this applies to the filters that have global presets. So that's going to be Silver Effects Pro, we'll open that one up, Color Effects Pro, and HDR Effects Pro. And what we're seeing in here are one button presets uh, accessing our favorites. So you customize these by favoriting any of the presets or recipes or filters inside of the plugin itself. And then those show up in this palette. And what this means is that I can very quickly access that filter without having to launch the filter, dig through the menus, find the one that I want. So if I know that I have certain favorites, I can just put them in here. And to make it even quicker to apply these, you can choose to have this so that when you click on one of these buttons, it launches the NIC interface and applies that filter, or it simply applies it within Photoshop without ever even launching NIC. And that's the way that I've got it set up right now. So this is how we're gonna start. So I'm gonna start with the ColorFX Pro. I have a couple of pictures that I'm gonna work with from a recent trip to Taipei. And I've got a few of my favorites here. So I'm just gonna click on one of these. We'll start with cross-processing. So I click on this, it doesn't launch the NIC interface. We see over here on the right that Photoshop has duplicated the layer for me. It has just applied the filter and it's even named the filter, uh, the filter layer to, I'm sorry, the uh, name the layer itself to match the name of the preset. So I know now when I look back at it, what preset I had used. So that's the cross-processing one. So that's a quick way to apply it. Go, okay, that's kind of cool. You know, this is, this is nice. Uh, let's try something else. So I'm gonna hide that, go back to my background layer and let's do another one. Let's try bicolor filters this one and give it a moment again it does the same thing it duplicates that layer it will rename it and of course it applies the look to it it's so this becomes a really quick and easy way to just try different looks i'm going to try one more to try different looks without having to jump into the interface so again it can be a huge time saver at this stage of just experimenting and playing 
And as you're going to see in a moment, once we get into the, okay, now I'm ready to really apply these to a whole bunch of pictures, it'll be a huge time saver. So at this point, I've gone through these. I've added a few of them. If I want to preview what each one looks like, if you, uh, if you option click on the eye in Photoshop, in case you didn't know, that'll reveal just that layer. And so it makes it really easy to quickly go through and decide what direction I might want to go. And let's just say, for the sake of the demo, that I decide what I really want to do is kind of combine all of these. I want some kind of a combination of these three. So let's just start over. I'm going to get rid of all three of these, go back to the original layer, and I'm going to change my settings in the NIC, uh, in the palette here. And you'll see here at the bottom, it says apply favorite filter recipes and last edit to in Photoshop or apply in the NIC collection. And that's where I want to go next. So I changed that preference. And now I'll start with, I don't know, let's just say I'll start with film grain on here, start with that last one. And it now launches the NIC plugin, launches ColorFX Pro, and it applies that film grain filter up there. Let's just make this a little bit bigger. So now I've got that film grain applied. And now just in case you're not already familiar with ColorFX Pro, I'll give you a very, very quick tour of this. The way ColorFX Pro works is on the right-hand side, you have filters. And right now we have one filter, film grain. And each one of these filters can be individually adjusted. So if I wanted to play with the size of the grain, for example, if I make the grain more per pixel, it's kind of inverse because it says grain per pixel. So the higher number, the finer the grain, go down the other direction, I get less per pixel, so bigger grain. So I can adjust, for example, what that is. So let's get it, let's see it right about there. I kind of like that. And now to add another filter, I click on this little button here that says add filter and it adds a empty filter holder. And you may have noticed when I did that over on the left-hand side, the filter library opened up. And now I have access to all the different filters that we might want to play with. So let's go ahead and add one. I'll add bicolor filter. And this is now added bicolor filters on top of film grain. So I have both of these in place. Now, as I had said, when I first applied it in the preset, it was a little heavy handed. So I think I'll just dial this back a little bit. Let's take the opacity down a little. Okay, that's kind of cool. Let's add another one. So add another filter holder, go over to the left, look through the collection. I'll decide on cross processing this time. And you might've noticed by the way, there's a little star next to these. As, I've, as you've seen, I'm clicking on the same ones that I had in the palette because those were the buttons there. Those were buttons there because they were marked as favorites in here. So that's now in place. Uh, that's actually kind of good as it is. And uh, you know, let's, let's, let's just leave it at that. Let's say that that's what I like. So I might want to go ahead and apply this right now, or I might want to save this recipe to be used later on. So I'll, I'll save this one. Let's save it and I'll type in vintage. We're going to call this the vintage recipe. Click OK, and that drops it into my custom recipe list. So you'll see here, this palette has now gone from filter library to recipes. I'm in the custom list and there's the one that I just created. So if I wanted to access this from within Photoshop, I just click that little star, adds it as a favorite, and now it's going to show up in my Photoshop list. Above that, you'll see another recipe that I created earlier. Um, I've called this one Taipei and you can see on the right, I've put a lot more time and effort into this one. There's quite a lot more going on. So I'll go ahead and mark that one as a favorite as well. So I'll be able to access that and I want to apply this. But before I apply it, I want to make a change. Let's say that uh, I'm looking at this and uh, kind of, you know, it's pretty much good. I think maybe I want a little bit more glow in my high key. So I'm going to take my glow up a little bit and maybe I want my green to be a little bit grainier. So let's go to my green here and drag that down, make it a little bit chunkier, a little bit more grain on there. Okay. So I've just made two changes to this preset. If I apply this right now, as I'm going to do, just click okay, but I don't save that recipe. I now have no way to get back to that that preset with those changes to it. Now, obviously I just made two changes, but imagine that you had made a bunch more and you go, oh man, I just did this, but I don't have a way to go back to that. Well, you actually do now because you have another new feature in here that's called last edit. So let me go to another photo. I'll go to this one here, this sushi picture, same trip. And if I look at the ColorFX Pro list here, if I look at just my recipes, you'll see there's the vintage one that I created. There's the Taipei one that I favorited, but there's this other button called last edit. When I click on last edit, it's going to launch me back into the plugin and reapply exactly what I had just done. It's, if it was just a preset, it just applies that preset. But in our case, it's the preset with the changes. So the enhanced glow and under the film grain, the reduced or enlarged film grain. And so all of that is there. So this is a huge thing. I know it's pretty common to spend a bunch of time in a plugin, tweaking, tweaking, tweaking. You get the look that you love. You go, this is awesome. You hit OK. And then you go, oh, my God, I forgot to save it. Now I have to redo all of this. At this point, if you realize you forgot to save it, you have that last edit button that will take you back in there. And at this point, I can say, oh, yeah, yeah okay, now let's save this recipe and you can save it off as, as whatever you like. So that's huge. So those are the two big things within Lightroom that I wanted to show you. 
we've got the palette, we have access to the presets within the palette, our favorites, and we have the ability to apply that edit directly in Photoshop without having to go to the Nick collection, or of course, go into the Nick collection, which is, uh, which is just a great workflow enhancement. All right, let's switch over to Lightroom Classic now. Now Lightroom Classic, I'm gonna pick up uh, with the same series of photos, the same shoot, the same trip, another trip to Taipei, and uh, another uh, shot from Taipei, and nice little photo here, I'm calling this Sidewalk Eaters. And I'm gonna edit this one also in Color Effects Pro 4. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Now, in Lightroom, we are starting with a raw file, and so I have to allow Lightroom to convert this into a TIFF file that we'll send off to, uh, off to the Nick collection. So we, say, we let it say, edit a copy. Of course, I don't have any other option than that, have to edit a copy. And under here, you have your file format. Now, at this point, you can choose between TIFF, Photoshop, and JPEG. Honestly, I'm not sure why anybody would choose JPEG at this point, because you really you lose some flexibility in your quality. Um, PSD is a perfectly good option, but TIFF is where we really want to be right now because TIFF is going to allow me to re-edit the file later, which is incredible. So let's just go ahead and start editing this. Click on the edit button. It's going to render out that TIFF file, open it up in the plugin here, and we're going to see a dialog pop up that tells us one of the huge new features in the Nick Collection 3. It's this guy right here. It says, good to know before working with the TIFF file. And essentially, this is saying that I've chosen wisely by going to TIFF, because with the TIFF file, I have the ability to enable the option to resume editing later. And so I'll click OK to dismiss that dialog. And then down here in the bottom right corner, next to the Cancel and Save button, you'll see a line that says Save and Edit Later. And it warns you it's going to make larger files. And, and it is going to make larger files, but this is what gives us that flexibility. So I can turn this on or off. Obviously, I, I want it on right now. And so what this means is I will be able to do whatever I want in here, but then come back to this filter at any time and make changes to what I had previously done. So let me show you. I'm just going to do something really obvious that is different. Let's just go apply, see this one here, this contrast in black and white. So this is, clearly I've applied a filter here. It's a black and white filter. I play around with it, I don't play around with it, whatever. I'm just gonna go ahead and save this right now. Let's say that I had put some effort into this and I really like it, but after I apply it, whether we're talking about the instant after I hit save or an hour later, the day later, a week, a year later, at some point I'm looking at it thinking, I ah, just, you know, eh, it wasn't quite right. I should have, done the black and white a little bit differently. I should have made the shadows a little bit less contrasty, whatever, some change that I wanna make. But I saved this days or years ago and I, I, I need to go back. I have no idea where I started. Well, I have the ability to re-edit. So before I go into re-editing, I wanna show you how this actually works. If I right click on this thumbnail and I choose show in Finder, and here's the file, let me open this up in preview. And we're gonna see what's actually happening. This is now, it's called a multi-page TIFF file. This is the original TIFF that was created, and this is the new black and white version of it. And what you're not seeing in between here is the hidden metadata that is effectively telling the Nick plugin what to do to the image to make it look this particular way. But what we have in the preview file is both full resolution TIFFs of the original color and the affected one. So let me just close that, go back over to Lightroom, and I'm gonna right click on this picture again, edit in, and go back into Color Effects Pro. An important, important point here is to select Edit Original. This is what allows me to continue this. This is going to now open up that multi-page TIFF file into the plugin and allow me to continue editing it or undo or redo anything that I had done before. So as it's drawing, you can already see as it's drawing that the color image was there. So that's already kind of given away the game that the image has not been destroyed. But if you look over here on the right-hand side, you see all of our filters that have been added. If I turn these off, you'll see there is the original color image. So it's completely re-editable at any time. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and let's apply uh, under sample. Let's go to my favorites. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and apply that Taipei filter that I had done before. And again, if I wanted to make some changes, of course I could, but I'm just going to go ahead and save that. So once again, the ability to go back and re-edit at any point is absolutely huge. This is something you simply could not do in Lightroom before. Once you had saved that file, once you had clicked the save button in the plugin, then that was it. There was no changing. If you wanted to make even one tiny change, you'd have to start all over again. And now, of course, we have the ability to re-edit that at any time. So that's huge. That's what the multi-page TIFF uh, uh, technology, multi-page TIFF application allows us to do. So next, what I want to do is move into a whole different plugin, because there is a whole new plugin inside of the Nick collection, and that's called Perspective Effects. Perspective Effects, as you might imagine, is all about changing or correcting the perspective. So we're going to start with the same photo here, actually. I'm going to right-click on this again, and this time I'm going to edit this in Perspective Effects. And now we're going to see a very important choice, or have an important choice to make. 
I can choose to edit the original, which is at this point going to effectively flatten what I've just done in ColorFX Pro. So if I want to be able to continue editing the ColorFX Pro work later, because I'm going into a different plugin, I would choose to edit a copy. And by editing a copy, it's going to duplicate this TIFF file, leaving that multi-page TIFF intact, but opening up a new copy of that into perspective effects for me to do whatever I'm gonna do with. So you really have a lot of flexibility in your, here in how you wanna go. What I like to tell people too is you know, these, these do make for some pretty big files and these can certainly start to fill up your hard drive if you are doing a ton of these. But what I think a lot of people will do is save multiple copies as they go, as they're going from one filter to another. And then once you get to a, a close to a final stage, you can discard some of those older ones, free up some space on your hard drive. But at the end of the day, storage is pretty cheap these days. So, you know, you make your own decision on what you want to do, but having the ability, the flexibility to go back and re-edit at any stage is, is pretty awesome to have. Okay. So perspective effects. Perspective effects is all about correcting perspective of your photos. And I'm a big fan of, for photos like this, having really straight true lines, having perfect verticals, perfect horizontals. It's just one of those things that I really like in my photography. Clearly in this photo, I failed miserably at this. I did not stand in the spot and hold the camera right to get that perfect, those perfect lines on there. So I want to, I want to correct this. If we look at the photo here, you see there's a lot of really nice vertical lines and nice horizontal lines. So this is gonna be pretty easy to correct. And I'm gonna do this completely manually just to show you the power that we have in here. There's a perspective palette in here that I'm gonna work with. And within the perspective palette, I have four different ways I can work. I can base my shift purely on vertical lines. So if I only have known vertical lines, I can do that. Same thing with horizontal, if I have known horizontal lines. If I have something that is a perfect square or rectangle, I can use this choice. And this is pretty cool, because if I move these around, imagine if you will, that we're looking at a photo where that shape right there was supposed to be a straight wall, um, but it, that's the way it is because of where I was standing. I can just line these around it and it'll fix it. But the tool that I like the most is the eight point tool. This, this one here allows the most flexibility. So you have two vertical and two horizontal lines and you just position these in your scene wherever they should be to identify nice vertical and horizontal lines. Now I've just dragged them quickly into position, but now I need to get them precise. And the precision is what makes this work. So you really do need to be precise. And the way that you do that is by clicking on this little circle with the uh, crosshair in it. When I click and drag that to change the position, it zooms in, you get this loop that pops up and it zooms in and you can get very precise with your positioning. So I'm gonna choose to line this one up on the edge of that sign. So we can see there's kind of three vertical lines. I'm gonna choose the center line. So I'll drop that there. And then I need to put the bottom one in the same place so I can drop that into place there. Let's get that right. So, all right, same thing with the horizontal ones. So let's put this one over here. And now one of the things that's gonna be kind of a challenge is getting that line or that dot exactly on the line. I'm zoomed in quite far. This is zooming in past 100% here. And I'm moving my mouse hand just the tiniest, tiniest bit. And you can see how much the mouse is moving, how much the cursor is moving. And if I'm trying to get that, it's like, oh, missed. Oh, we're uh, get, uh, trying to get that spot. And so what I need to do is slow down the cursor. Well, if you look underneath the circle, it says press shift to slow cursor. So as I hold the shift key down on the keyboard, now I'm moving my hand the same physical amount, but look at how much less the cursor is moving. This allows me that extreme precision to get in there and put it exactly where I want. So the idea would be that I grab this, get it close. As I get close, press the shift key down, that slows it down and I line it perfectly into place. So quick, slow, dropped it, quick, slow, get into place. And one more time, quick, slow, drop it in. And there we go. So now I've got all four of these lines lined up. And if I hit the preview button down here, it realigns the image, distorts the image to correct the way that I want it to correct. And if you look outside of this gray crop area, you can see in here how the image has been distorted, kind of angled out, skewed out. And by skewing it that way, it has given me those perfect lines. Awesome. So I hit apply, save that. And now I've got this perspective correction saved as part of my photo. So I love it. So that's that's the effect, that's the uh, essential of how this tool works. And because this is the new one, I've got a bunch of other photos that I wanna show you just to give you some more ideas of what this perspective effects tool can do. So let's go to this one first. This is gonna be a really easy one. This is shot on the other side of the world. This one is in Los Angeles. Let's open this guy up. Again, starting from a raw file. And this one is quite clearly shot from the ground with the wide angle lens pointing up at these buildings. And so we have the telltale perspective distortion that's happening that's leaning in because we're 
pointing up with a wide angle lens. To fix this, one button. Perspective effects, click the auto button, and boom, just like that, it straightens it out and it looks fantastic. Great, suddenly I just climbed a ladder and was able to hold my camera perfectly straight to get those straight lines, love it. All right, so that's one thing that we can do. Let's do this one next. This one's quite an extreme sample. Uh, this is shot with a fisheye lens. And this is obviously intentionally shot with a fisheye lens. This was no accident. This is a, this is in, I believe in Hamburg, Germany. It's this cool series of columns in front of this office building. And, um, and when I was there, I thought this is a really neat fisheye lens photo. So I got my fisheye and I shot this photo and I love it. So maybe you're looking at this later and you're thinking, yeah, I really should have shot this picture with a normal lens. That would have been handy, but I didn't because I wasn't very clever. So I want to see if I can fix this. I want to see if I can correct this to make it look like I had shot it with a regular lens. And Lightroom is taking its sweet time this morning. There is, it is still preparing the file for editing. There it goes. <clears throat> Every once in a while, you have to wonder, what is Lightroom thinking? All right, here we go. So this image is now, we're in perspective effects. I'm going to start with the uh, distortion button. I'm gonna click on auto here. And with one click, we see a huge amount of correction already happening. And this has happened because of this camera profile that had already been downloaded. If, I, if it hadn't, then when I first clicked this, it would say, I need to download this. And it's a tiny file, a couple hundred kilobytes, I think, and it would download. And what this profile is, the profile file is, is a unique profile for this camera and lens combination. So we see up here, this was shot on a Canon EOS 1DS Mark III, old photo, with a 15 millimeter fisheye lens. And so that camera and lens combination has a unique profile that DxO has created for distortion correction. And so we see here just how much it's already done. It's really straightened this image out. If I wanted to bring some of that fisheye back, there's an intensity slider. I can just kind of dial this down, bring some of that distortion back in there but we're gonna leave it up totally straight because that's what I want. But at this point, we can also now see that much like with the, uh, that sidewalk eaters photo, I apparently was not holding the camera perfectly straight. Um, a little bit off, off kilter that day, I suppose. And so I wanna correct this. I wanna finish correcting this. I wanna make this perfectly straight. So we're gonna use that perspective tools down there. I'm gonna click on the auto button this time and just let it automatically do what it does. And, and suddenly every line is perfectly straight. Now at this point, I think it looks great, but Right or wrong, I feel like it's a little bit vertically stretched. I want to kind of compress it a little bit just because I think it'll feel a little bit better, a little bit more natural. So down here, I've got a manual override, this horizontal vertical ratio, and I'll just drag that down a little bit, just a touch, just to kind of squish it. And now I feel like this is a bit more natural. And before I exit out of here, I want to show you just what was done to this picture. Remember the sidewalk eaters photo, how it had just a little bit of perspective skewing on it? Watch this one. As I turn off the crop, that's what's actually happened to this file. That's how much the image has been distorted to straighten out the center punch, the part that really matters. I think it's just so cool to see this. And at this point too, if I turn the cropping back on, you'll notice that I can recrop the image. So effectively the software has automatically cropped it so that we don't get any of these black borders in there, but I could change this. Maybe I, uh, maybe I want to get a little bit more in there. Maybe I don't care. Maybe I, I, I don't care that there's some black borders up there. I'm going to put a title up there, but I want more on the sides. I can do that. Of course, I could turn off the um, turn off the aspect ratio here. Let's go unconstrained, and I can make it any kind of ratio that I want. So you can recrop it. It's just that the software automatically crops it to eliminate any of the black invisible space and give you the maximized uh, maximum number of pixels possible. And it also does that in, uh, originally maintaining your original aspect ratio. So again, you can go in and change that at any time if you like. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, let's just cancel out of here, make this quicker and move on to another photo. All right, totally different approach here, totally different effect. Let's go into perspective effects again. This is a clearly a group photo shot at a wedding or some kind of party. And we can see it was shot with quite a wide angle lens. And if you look at the edges here, you can see that our people on the edges are quite distorted. Um, this is the kind of thing that happens with really wide angle lenses. And you know, the easy thing to say is, well, you should have shot it with a longer lens, get farther back. But in a situation like this, you, you can't, right? The room is only so big. You got so many people, you can't shoot with a longer lens from farther away. This is your only option. And so unfortunately, what this would typically mean is you end up with this photo with your people on the edges distorted. And um, that's not fair to the people on the edges. So now you can shoot a photo like this with confidence that you'll be able to correct it using perspective effects. So let me bring your attention again to the woman here on the left. She's the easiest to see this happening to. 
And I'm gonna go over here to this volume deformation button and simply turn it on. And just like that, look at how much she's corrected. Let me, let me toggle this on and off. Look at the correction that's happening there. It's absolutely phenomenal. And at first glance, you might think, okay, well, you just took the image and kind of squished it horizontally. And by doing that, you've, you've fixed the people on the edges. But if that was the case, then the people in the middle would have gotten squished as well, and they would now look skinnier than they should. So watch again, watch this fellow in the middle as I toggle this on and off, and you'll notice that he is not changing, but the people, the people on the edges are. And so it really gives us that incredible power to correct the edges of the image without affecting the center part of it. It's super, super powerful, super useful. So again, giving you that flexibility to shoot with a wider angle lens than you might normally be comfortable doing because of the distortion that you get, now you know that you can fix it. So it really opens up some possibilities for you. All right, one more example in here. This is a totally different use of that same plug in here, that same perspective effects. This one is a, we're going to give a, uh, or make a kind of tiny village that, that tilt shift lens approach that, um, train model train set that's the word i was looking for that model train set look and we do that with this thing called miniature effect I turn this on and right away i get this band of focus in the middle with the defocus falling off the edges and i can position this wherever i like so let's say i want to rotate this a little bit make it a little bit skinnier you know, kind of a narrower band of focus i can make the fall off more or less if i want to i can make the amount of defocusing more or less so actually turn it down just a little bit it takes on a little bit more realism we start to see kind of the focused treetops poking up here, the sharp band in the middle and the blurry off of the edges. And now it looks like one of those model train photos, that, that kind of classic thing you can get from a tilt shift lens. So very, very cool. So I saved this and I've just got this really neat effect that gets applied to this. This type of a look, by the way, works best on elevated photos. So this was shot with a drone or if you're up on a tall building looking down on a city street, this can be really effective too. Uh, but that's the, kind of a, that's the kind of photo that this, this works best on. So, Angela, that's everything that I wanted to show you. That's the all the new goodies inside of the new Nick collection. What do you think? I think it's it's great. I mean, I said I've, I've liked the software for a long time, but I think um, every iteration that DxO brings out it improves, um, you know, in in a significant way. And now the introduction of perspective effects, I think, is is really great. And obviously, that's drawing on uh, viewpoint, isn't it? The technology it's in viewpoint, correct? But putting it into a different um, plug-in which is really really useful absolutely so, yeah it yeah, is it, I think it's great. adds that whole other layer of, of functionality into it that um, there really is a lot of fun it's very very cool to play with do you prefer to use it from within Lightroom or from Photoshop generally you know I my traditional workflow was always to go through Photoshop for multiple reasons. Uh, one was because from Photoshop, I could re-edit the photos by opening an image as a smart layer, then a smart object, then I could apply the filter as a smart filter and re-edit that. But now within Lightroom Classic, we have the ability to re-edit from within Lightroom, so that may change a little bit. Now, mm -hmm. for my personal workflow, I actually use Lightroom, uh, well, CC, the cloud version, I don't use Lightroom Classic myself anymore. I'm using the Lightroom Cloud version, which does not yet have a plugin architecture. So for me personally, I'm still going through Photoshop because I have to. Uh, I don't have that ability to access the plugins directly from within Lightroom. But so this, it really depends on what you're using. If you're using Lightroom Classic, then absolutely this is now the, the new great way to go. If, you, if you're still gonna blend photos, if you wanna have multiple filters blended together or multiple photos blended together, and you're using Lightroom Classic, then you're still gonna to wanna to send those to Photoshop to do the work there. And of course, we've already seen the tools, the accessibility of the tools in Photoshop. If you're using Lightroom Cloud version, then you have to go to Photoshop regardless. But you, of course, have that capability. I can't do it on my iPad because uh, because the plugins aren't on iOS, but I can do this on the desktop, send the photos to Photoshop, and then access all the plugins there. I always like to use Photoshop, A, because that's my preference generally anyway, but I love the fact that you get the layers so you can, yeah. um, you know, apply uh, uh, mass to them or, you know, uh, vary the opacity and that kind of thing, which I find really, really useful. It's also nice. Yeah, it's it's incredibly than, powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and rather than press save, you can actually select to use a brush, can't you? And then paint in the effect, which can be very handy as well. Particularly sure, if you're you doing can. Something yeah, like sharpening or something like that. Right, absolutely. And with these, if you're doing the smart object mm -hmm. technique, so you take your layer, turn that into a smart object, and um, then you have a mask on that, 
that's the Photoshop mask. So you kind of have kind of a best of both. It, that's doing the smart object gives you the ultimate flexibility. It also gives you the biggest files, but it gives you that ultimate flexibility where you yeah. can go back all the way down to the raw file layer and make changes to the raw photo and then have it cascade through to everything else. So I think it's great now. So we've got basically there's eight plugins in the package. It used to be seven, now it's eight. You've Sounds got right. something <laughs> for enhancing colors, creating great black and white, um, reducing noise, uh, controlling sharpness. It's just, it's, and now we've got um, working on geometric uh, distortion as right. well, which is really useful. And don't forget about the film looking one, the analog effects. It's one of Good my point. favorites. Yes, for that's a really fun cool one to play with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Th that's the sort of thing I think that really is an example of one that you play around and you create a look that you like and you want to save it because you, you come back to that on a regular basis. Yeah, I tend to think of analog effects as very much a playground where you can go in and, and you get some really dramatic effects and you can do crazy things like have double exposures and, and a lot of things that you're not going to apply to much of your work, but occasionally it's fun to, to go down that path. But it is very much a playground of, of adjustments. Whereas Color Effects Pro is kind of the Mac Daddy of all the corrective and creative control, but you can do so much in there. There's so much power in there that you can just do it all in one place, but it's less of a, a playground. It's analog effects is much more, let's just see what this button does type of a place. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And of the plugins, do you have a favorite? Ooh, I have always been partial to silver effects. I am, I love black and white and you know, that's, that's probably the plugin that I've used the longest. I don't remember from the original history which ones came out first, but that was probably one of the ones that I used to, uh, had my original introduction to. You gotta remember that back in the days of, of Nick Collection, uh, Nick Software rather, the plugins were sold individually and they were quite expensive for each yeah. individual one, maybe $150 per filter, I think. And so Silver Effects would have been one of the first ones that I would have bought because it's just, it's just so powerful and it's a really, really good black and white converter. That's a good point, actually, because I think I think the uh, the full package is something like one hundred and twenty five dollars, uh, one hundred and twenty five pounds now, which is I think is great value. Yeah, sounds right. And yeah, for the whole effects, thing, I would really say it's my favourite too. Uh, and it, one of the nice things about that is you have a collection of recognisable film names. If you shot black and white yes. film, then you'll recognise some of the films that you can select. And it it doesn't just recreate the contrast; it kind of creates the tonality and the grain of the film as well, which is really interesting. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. And you get a little bit of that now in Color Effects Pro because in the, I think it was the NIC 2.5 update, I believe it was, uh, DxO added a series of film stocks into Color Effects Pro. And so you do have some of those recognizable film stocks in there. So if you're going to do a color photo effect, or you can do black and white in Color Effects Pro as well, but mm -hmm. um, obviously if you're going to really do black and white, you should go into, into Silver Effects. But within Color Effects, you do have some great film stocks in there to work with that are very, very flexible as well. So you can get that recognizable film look and then tweak it however you want to make it truly unique. Well, it's been great chatting with you. Thanks very much for taking us through the, uh, the new features. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Angela. Bye-bye.